Good morning and welcome to the first meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2019. Can I ask everyone please to switch off their electronic devices or turn them to silence so they don't affect the committee's work this morning? Item number one is decision on taking business in private. Do members agree to take items three and four in private this morning? Thank you. Item two is post-legislative scrutiny, uh, the Freedom of Information Scotland Act 2002. And I'd like to welcome our witnesses to the meeting this morning, Darren Fitzhenry, Scottish Information Commissioner, and Margaret Keyes, Head of Enforcement Scottish Information Commission. Can I please invite Darren Henry to make a short opening statement? Thank you very much, Convener, uh, for this opportunity to give evidence today uh, as part of your consideration of the post-legislative scrutiny of the Freedom of Information Scotland Act 2002. Uh, as I set out in my evidence of the 22nd of March uh, last year, we have in Scotland a freedom of information system that has high levels of public awareness, is actively used and results in a lot of information being provided to people who can use it uh, to get involved, to raise concerns, to campaign for change and to participate in the decisions which affect them. However, it's important not to rest on our laurels. Uh, as you've also heard, there have been concerns raised about the system and it's important to address these. A number of those concerns were about the freedom of information performance and practice of public authorities, uh, particularly the Scottish Government. Uh, I'm aware that the committee wished to defer detailed consideration of post-legislative scrutiny until I had the opportunity to proceed with my intervention so that it could consider how that work related to the broader calls for scrutiny. I can confirm that as helpfully set out in the SPICE briefing, I have completed the assessment phase of the intervention, uh, that is the consideration of what has gone wrong, the, the reasons for that, and my conclusions, uh, my conclusions on this and my recommendations for improving the Government's FOI practice were set out in my assessment report. These recommendations have been accepted by the Scottish Government and we have now agreed an action plan for them to implement the recommendations. We're therefore now in the implementation phase and monitoring phase of the intervention uh, and I stand by today to provide uh, uh, the committee with uh, answers in relation to any questions they may have on the intervention generally. That is however just one intervention, uh, albeit a major one, with a focus on the practice of a particular authority. I also greatly appreciate, uh, greatly appreciate the opportunity to update the committee on my views of the uh, legislative and structural FOI issues which could fall within the scope of scrutiny. Areas which the committee may wish to consider include a greater focus on interventions, calling upon some of the lessons that we learned from the Scottish Government intervention, and changes on the rules on pro proactive publication to strengthen and update the duty, making the provisions more agile and that may include adding powers of enforcement, introducing new, uh, a new code of practice to drive the development of proactive publication, taking into account changes in technology and changes in the ways that people access information. In addition to these two areas, the current system uh, excludes certain bodies uh, from parts uh, of the uh, Act, particularly the, the Lord Advocate and Procurator's Fiscal, uh, and also the First Minister's uh, veto. And I would suggest that these are areas that are also ripe for reassessment. I know that the creation of a duty to document uh, was raised by a number of contributors to the last evidence session, and I stand by to provide evidence uh, on that if desired. Finally, as you may be expect, there are a number of technical amendments that my office uh, has uh, considered and identified over the years as being desirable, and which I would hope could also be considered as part of any post-legislative scrutiny. Thank you very much, Mr Fitzhenry. Um, we are following the duty of the committee today. We have a post-legislative function on, on this committee, and it's going to be up to us at the end of today to decide whether we undertake post-legislative scrutiny of the FOISA 2002 Act. Looking back over the evidence you gave us uh, on the 22nd of March last year and also what you've said this morning, do I detect from your comments that you feel that the Act does now need some post-legislative scrutiny? Th that is indeed the case, uh, Kavino. It's been some time since the, the Act was obviously enacted to, be, to begin with. Uh, society has changed somewhat over, over that time. Uh, we've, we had a situation whereby fewer than 50% of households had uh, 
internet act access uh, back in 2002. We're now at a situation point whereby it's comfortably over the into the 80s uh, of percent. Uh, we've got uh, a society that demands more information, expects more information. We've got a number of other initiatives. We've got open government, open data. Uh, digital strategies. Uh, the world has not stopped, but the, the uh, act uh, has is sort of frozen in time. We certainly did have some scrutiny and amendment in 2013, uh, but it wasn't a, a comprehensive look, and there are still a number of areas, particularly in relation to proactive publication, where I think uh, we could develop matters further, and also, as I say, in relation to uh, another proactive thing, proactive intervention to improve authority practice, which is where a lot of the concerns about uh, the current system lie. Let me pick up on that point, Mr Fitzhenry, because um, you talk about proactive um, publication, and uh, it seems to me, and I was very aware from the evidence from March last year, that we currently operate within a system where our public authorities hold information, and if members of the public want that information, they have to request it, and then it goes through a process and it comes back to them. But it was clear from the evidence, and I think this is what you're driving up with proactive publication, that other countries, and I think some Scandinavian countries as well, just have a system where they have a duty to publish this information and therefore you don't have the, the push and pull of having to request it. That seems to be a much more open uh, way to do business. Is that the kind of model that you would be looking to? Uh, at, at the moment, at the moment we've, got, we've got a mix of the two uh, communities. So, so in Scotland we've got the system whereby the requests can be made for information people wish, but we also do have an existing duty to publish information, and that's uh, centred around uh, the uh, duty to have a publication scheme. So all authorities have to have a publication scheme setting out the classes of information that they uh, will publish, uh, and then they'll have a guide to information under that which sets out what they are actually publishing, and they'll put that out. So actually, in Scotland already, we already do have a proactive publication system. However, I think the focus in Scotland to date has been more on the applications rather than the publication duty. And I think there are ways in which we can refocus the effort to show that the publication duty is every bit as important. And actually, it's, it's that duty which gets more information to more people because we don't have records of how many people access all of the different public authorities' websites to get information and to access that, benefiting from freedom of information laws without actually recognising that, that they are doing so. But as I say, I, th I think, uh, as set out in my predecessor's uh, report on publication, um, the emphasis is not as strong on proactive publication in Scotland. I think we can improve that. Some of the structures set up in the legislation so that they, the concept of having a, a publication scheme is quite an old-fashioned concept. It comes from the idea of having your bit of paper where you're setting out the classes of information that you're going to publish. And what we've seen in practice is we've actually moved from when it started to there being a number of different publication schemes. We've actually in practice morphed to having a single model publication scheme, which all authorities are now signed up to. So in many ways, we've taken the discretion away. It's become a more centralised model already. So I, I do wonder why, we're, why we need to persist in the need of having publication schemes per se when we could just have uh, perhaps a code of practice setting out what classes need to be uh, implemented and what classes of information need to be published, allowing the authorities to focus more on what information are they then publishing under that having regard to the public interest. How does the um, Scottish system compare with transparency and open government in other countries? Um, there, are, there are a number of different ways of, of dealing with this. I mean, we're still a relatively young system in comparison with, with a number of, of, of countries. Certainly some of the, the northern European countries have obviously had their systems in place for, for, for a long time. Um, we, there's a right to information in, uh, index, uh, which is created by an international organisation, uh, and it sets out sort of a rating system about where the various countries lie uh, in the process. Now, Scotland's not currently rated on that, being for, the, for their purposes a subnational, uh, and is therefore not in, in, in the list. Uh, the UK is, however, in the list, and I think it is number... 
42nd out of 123 countries uh, behind Sweden, which is 101, uh, but in front of Russia, which is uh, 98 points on, on it. So, so it's, it's, it's actually viewed as being, the UK generally is viewed as being quite good in the process. Uh, that process, bear in mind, only looks at the legislation. It doesn't look at the practice. And I think if there was to be a system which looked at how good is the practice in the countries, I think you'd see the UK and Scotland as well higher up in the process. Thank you very much. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Vera. Um, Mr. Henry, your, your intervention was focused on requests from one particular uh, group of individuals, journalists, and about one organisation, the Scottish Government. Isn't that very a very narrow area to look at? The, the decision to, to proceed with the intervention uh, was one taken because there had been an amount of concern expressed at the Scottish Government's performance in that area. Uh, now, obviously, the Scottish Government's one of the biggest uh, public authorities that we deal with, and within uh, our remit, we, we've got the power to obviously deal with appeals of people who are unhappy with particular decisions, but we also have an assessment power and a power to intervene with authorities who are failing in their freedom of information practice. Now, in this case, we had a, a unanimous uh, parliamentary uh, motion following a debate, criticising, uh, and in fact condemning, the Scottish Government's freedom of information performance. And in the light of those concerns raised, I determined shortly after arriving in post that it was appropriate to look at those concerns and to address those and to see what improvements could be made. So, uh, in doing so, we then focused on the concerns which were raised to try to improve the practice of the authority. And as I say, we're obviously sort of in the middle of that process now looking at monitoring and, and implementation. So, yes, you could say, yes, it's one authority, but that was in relation to the powers I have and, and in fact, one of the functions I have to improve authority practice. But one of the lessons we're learning is that the report that was issued, we're going out uh, at various conferences uh, and meetings with other authorities and inviting them to look at that report, look at that report's findings and see if any of the findings that we made in relation to the Scottish Government have a wider read across to those other authorities. So we're trying to spread good practice through the report as, as well as addressing the specific concerns about that one important authority. Were the journalists themselves a, a major a force in terms of FOI requests and so forth? Do they form, do they form a major group there? They certainly are, are, are a major uh, group of requesters, as, as you would expect. They're not the major uh, group of uh, requesters as far as we can term, uh, ascertain from our statistics. Uh, you know, just normal, uh, everyday people tend to be the largest group uh, of requesters. But there's no doubt that the media are an important uh, group within that. And the power of the media uh, is, of course, to uh, any issues that they do find through the Freedom of Information request, that can then have wider visibility because of the publishing of that information. My understanding is that the Scottish Government uh, addressed the issues that were raised and are working with yourself uh, in that resolution. Is that correct? Yes, we, they've now developed an action plan which we've agreed uh, and we're in the process of the actual implementation of that action plan and monitoring throughout to, to, to keep uh, ascertaining how, how that's progressing and is it achieving the improvements that we would expect to see. Now, given the particular needs of this of this uh, group, the journalists, you, you, you touched briefly on the fact that you were uh, looking at other organisations in terms of the lessons learned from this particular intervention. Uh, are you going to be producing a report on that, or is is uh, are there any, anything that we can take from that? It's more more a question of of actually going to the authorities and explaining to them what interventions are for a start, because this is, we're, we're having a, a greater emphasis on proactive regulation and on taking, going forward with a regulation which ben, with, with an intervention which benefits the whole uh, audience of requesters to that authority. Uh, so we're, we're benefiting a lot of people rather than just the one applicant in, in, in an appeal. So what we're doing is we've taken the lessons learned and we're going in our normal uh, meetings with other groups of uh, authorities and in conferences and saying this is what an intervention is, these are some of the points that we uh, identified, please don't worry if you get an intervention yourself because the key purpose of that is to make things better for the requester and to make the authorities 
ability to meet its obligations better. Uh, and have a look at, at our intervention report and see what there is. So we don't have a, we're not judging uh, any improvement on those other authorities because of the report. We're inviting them to read the terms of the report and to see how that might relate to them. Bearing in mind that all authorities are different, they deal with different functions, they have different uh, types of information, but there could be some little nugget of gold within that report which they think, ah, actually, that's a problem we have and that could help us in, in our FOI performance. How many interventions have you actually had up to now? Uh, our interventions, they're, they're scalable, so they, they range from a level one intervention, which might be a phone call or a quick email to an authority saying, we've noticed something that needs to be fixed, all the way up to a level three intervention, which is the Scottish Government one, which is a very in-depth one, or a level four intervention, which uses specific powers. Uh, last year, we had... Uh, sorry, if we've got the figures for you. We had over 230 interventions last uh, in the year 16, sorry, 1718. Of those, 223 were level ones. So they were that stitch in time, if you, if you like, type of intervention. We've noticed there's something wrong. Fix that, and hopefully that quick phone call, that quick email, just get, solves the problem there and then. Uh, the ones where you've got uh, more detail, the level two and level three interventions, we had seven level twos, two level threes, and uh, we'd recently completed two of the level fours, which were the actual enforcement action. Alex Neil, Can I, um, first of all, ask you, uh, in 2017, um, the, between 2017 and 2018, there was a 45% increase in the number of FOI requests, is my understanding. 2018, there were 3,050 FOI requests. And up until November last year, 2018, there was over 3,500 FOI requests. So that's a huge increase over a two-year period. Why do you think there's been such a massive increase in FOI requests over that period? I, sorry, could I just clarify? I th are those the figures for the Scottish Government's yes. uh, numbers? Uh, it's difficult to tell exactly what, why that would be the case. I think part of it is the there's a general increase in use of the provisions across the board in relation to a number of authorities. So we, we have seen an incremental increase uh, across, across authorities of increases in requests for information. Part of that is greater public expectation about obtaining public information from authorities. I think part of it's greater visibility of freedom of information, perhaps because of the intervention. That, that's maybe made people think, oh, yeah, I want to know the answer to, to this. Or a number of those uh, requests for information could be requests going behind the intervention, looking for, for uh, details, of, for example, of, of witness statements, or other pieces of information associated with it. So I, th I think in part it's, it's an incre increased visibility of freedom of information, it's an increased desire to use it, and it's the increased visibility of the Scottish Government's role there. Is it not the case that in all each of those years, less than 50% of FOI requests were made by individual members of the public? They came from other sources, from organisations. And is it not also the case that something like five individuals account for 20% of the requests and one individual counts for 12% of all the requests at an estimated cost to the public purse of £100,000. Is this not a total abuse of the system? I certainly don't know the specific figures in relation to the Scottish Government's internal numbers and, and, and those ones in relation... That's the numbers they gave me. So, based on those numbers, is the system not being abused by a, literally a handful of people. If there are any abuses or suspected abuses of the system, there are currently processes and procedures within the system to deal with that. So in relation to freedom... Why haven't they been dealt with then? Well, that, that, that might be a question for the Scottish Government as to why they may, haven't sought to apply some of those provisions. Because there's a vexatious uh, provision which uh, allows uh, a request for information to be refused on the grounds that the request, not the request or, but the request is vexatious, and that can take into account a number of factors, such as numbers of requests, uh, the, the value of the information being sought, and so on. So, and we've provided detailed guidance on that. Recently, just last month, we had a, a quarter session judgment 
giving further clarification on the use of vexatious uh, provisions and, and what it means. Now, I, I, sorry. So, uh, well, it's not just the number, it's also the nature of the question. I mean, at a recent uh, Holyrood magazine conference, the Minister for Parliamentary Business gave a couple of examples of the kind of questions. I mean, two of the questions were, how many copies of Ruth Davidson's autobiography have been purchased by the Scottish Government? And how much has been spent by the Scottish Government over the previous three years on cranes? And that was not the purpose of the FOI legislation. I mean, I, I'm probably the only member who was here when the legislation went through. This is a total abuse of the, of the legislation. Um, and in September, I'm told, one individual sent 84 requests in less than an hour, literally one every 40 seconds. I mean, that's not the purpose. You know, people are abusing this. It's not time we crack down on the abuse and, and freed up more resource for the genuine inquirers. I think that there's a fundamental problem with, with how you would achieve that beyond, beyond the existing provisions. Uh, and that problem is that uh, you'd be seeking to come to a view as to whether somebody's request was valid or not, whether it was a worthwhile request or not. And what's uh, worthwhile is very much a subjective view, which differs from person to person. In relation to the extremes, which you've mentioned there, I do question sometimes why authorities don't seek to rely on the existing provisions. And indeed, at the Holyrood uh, conference, when some of the examples were provided, one of the journalists who was speaking also said, well, if he'd put in a request in that way, he would have expected a, a vexatious response to come in. Now, I know from my uh, interviews with a number of Scottish government uh, individuals as part of my intervention, there was a, a reluctance to use the uh, vexatious provisions. Uh, now, that's unfortunately not something I can control. I can't make them use the vexatious provisions. All I can do is say they are there, they're available. We've got recent court uh, guidance on how they can be used, as well as guidance from our office. Uh, so ultimately, if there are these provisions which would allow a, a request to be refused because it's vexatious, um, it's for the authorities to, to, to use it. Uh, and if an appeal is made, I'll then consider as to whether the authority has correctly applied those provisions. And just the, is, the second, maybe worth just on the, the court of session judgment we had, it was actually one in where we agreed with the Scottish Prison Service that a request made to them was vexatious. We agreed that was appealed, but the court of session upheld our decision. So that was a, a case where we agreed that a request was vexatious. The real question is, uh, I remember in the very first session of the Scottish <laughs> Parliament when we were formed, uh, there were daily stories, literally daily stories about expenses, you know, say somebody had spent six pounds on a fish supper and stuff like that, which of course is, was rather stupid on the part of the individual, but that's another matter. And George Reid, the then presiding officer, changed the system so that all the expenses claims went on the website of the parliament. And since then, we've had no, uh, practically no FOI request because the answer is it's already published. Uh, so, should, is there not a lesson in there that, for example, in terms of all the procurement contracts and everything the Scottish Government orders, whether it's an autobiography from Ruth Davison's or when mine comes out, whether there are many sales, there'll be m many more sales of that, I'm sure, than uh, Ruth Davidson's. Uh, but uh, is there not a lesson from how the Scottish Parliament handled the expenses issue? which became a victim of FOI uh, and published all the information. And then it was up to people to dig themselves for, you know, adding up in different ways. Uh, could we not do something similar across the board, as other countries do? Briefly on that already, the, pre, the proactive publication yeah, but this, point. But this no? is a much more comprehensive approach. Okay. Darren Fitzhenry. Yes, I, I think very much that, that's one example of one of the benefits of proactive publication. Uh, another example is that, that it, it actually builds up trust. So from our source Maury polling, 77% uh, of uh, people are more likely to trust uh, an authority which publishes more information. So, so there are a lot of benefits for the proactive publication. We can't for certain say that by publishing more, you definitely get, more, get fewer requests for information because it varies depending upon the type of information you're pushing out. But the example you've just given is one clear one whereby uh, you are going to re greatly reduce the request for information in those areas. Thank you. Willie Coffey. 
Yeah, good morning to you, to you both. Um, I wonder, Darren, could you tell us how did you deal with the issues that came up last March, uh, principally the complaints about lack of minute taking and the failure to create information and so on? I remember the discussion that took place at the committee and it was clearly stated by you that these things were not within the scope of the Act. How did you deal with them from that point till, till now? Yes, uh, the, the creation of records is, is, is a difficult one and certainly that duty to document which, which uh, ha was mentioned by a number of the contributors. The current system is that there is there's no duty to document, certainly as part of freedom of information legislation. It's, the focus is very much on the provision of information which is held uh, by, by the authority and the publication of information that's held by the authority. Uh, we have, in a number of decisions, specifically drawn reference or referenced the fact that information that we would have expected to be there wasn't there. Uh, so we've, we've, we've drawn attention to that. There is, uh, I've sort of looked, I looked again after, after March, so I look, we've looked again at, at the various documents and policies we have, that there is some reference in our Section 62, sorry, Section 61 Code of Practice. Uh, to the creation of records, but again, in that code of practice, which is purely practice, it's not a duty, it's not a legal duty, uh, it's best practice, and it refers to um, having procedures by authorities to decide what information they should keep. And they've put a very wide interpretation on keep to include, to include create. So, so, there's, so there is a reference to the, uh, that authorities should be considering a number of factors in determining what should be created. Uh, but again, it's very procedural. It's, it's not going down into the detail of being able to say, and certainly not me being able to say, you must record X or you must record Y. So the current processes are very uh, quiet on, on, on that area. That There's a question as to whether it, it lives in freedom of information as a process or whether it lives in records management. And there are different uh, approaches in different countries. So for example, in uh, British Columbia, they've recently had an enactment which uh, places it very much on the chief records officer that they may issue direct, uh, directions or guidance on information, including the, keep, the creation of records. Uh, whereas in, uh, I think, Denmark it is, it's, it's seen more as being a, a freedom of information type uh, function. So there are different approaches elsewhere uh, on that area. Uh, there are also different approaches as to whether it should be a general duty. So it should there just be a general duty to publish and document, which, for example, New Zealand has got a very wide duty. And the problems with that are then difficulties in enforcing it, uh, compared with other, other countries uh, where more specific lists of information uh, are, are provided. What did, you, what did you say, though, about the, the existence of, or otherwise, of minutes? Because that was a big issue raised at the time. There aren't any minutes kept. And that clearly wasn't in the scope of the Act at the time. Have you made some comment about that? And are you making any recommendations about, about you know, expecting that to happen? Or, or are you suggesting that we should be looking at that as a post-ledge function to extend the powers of the Act? I, th I think it's certainly a, a very important area, because ultimately, if... Uh, information is not recorded to begin with, that frustrates the rights to access to that information in due course. So I, I think it's certainly an area that, that should be looked at. As, as I've mentioned, there are other countries which are looking at it at the moment, uh, which, which are, are working on it. There is already some legislation in the Scottish uh, records legislation, which, and that might be where it, where it should live. So I'm not saying it, it definitely lives in the freedom of information legislation, but it's certainly an interesting area that I think justifies a closer look. There are many ways of dealing with it. There are a number of associated difficulties with it. You know, uh, is it just central government you're talking about? Is it all public authorities? What should be minuted? I think we can all, most people would say, well, decisions and the reasons for your decision should definitely be minuted. Uh, then it comes down to meetings, which meetings should be minuted, which not. And it's then a matter of having a view on those, on those matters. But as far as I'm concerned, the more that's minuted, the more that we can, we can release, uh, which is a positive thing. Last for me, you, know, you, you, you say you're in the implementation and monitoring phase, and you, you, you stress the importance of observing the practice from now on. How will you monitor practice from now on, and will you 
let us know how that's going on a, an annual basis or what's your intentions to? Yes, and, and in relation to the monitoring of practice, we, we first of all seeing what changes they're making to their policies. So we're, we're in active discussions with the government as to what policies they're going to be putting in place. And if we're, we're thinking that, oh, well, actually that clause isn't going to work, that, that's, that's not going to achieve, or that's going to create some of the same problems we've had before. We're in active discussions about how it will be changed. So we have a good, solid baseline for that. We're then uh, a number of bloggers and, and other people have been keeping us up to date on cases where they've had problems. So we're, we're, we're looking at those particular issues to see, are we seeing a sea change yet? We're getting monthly uh, inputs from the Scottish Government on their freedom of information statistics. So we're monitoring, uh, in statistical terms, how things are going. Uh, and government, surely. No, we, 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 every three months we, moni we, we monitor all, all authorities. But in relation right. to this intervention, we, we, the Scottish Government are providing us with monthly figures, which is, which is out of the, the normal course. So we're monitoring them to see how that goes. Uh, the Scottish Parliament passed uh, uh, a resolution asking, uh, in a debate, asking us to provide uh, updates on it. So it would be my intention to, to honour uh, that, that uh, by providing, uh, certainly for the first year, uh, into that uh, an update. Uh, I think thereafter it depends upon how long the monitoring uh, phase continues as to how many updates uh, will we'll continue after that, whether we have one or, or okay. maybe two after that. Thank you. Mr Fitzhenry, let me pick up on Willie Coffey's question on minuting of meetings, because we heard evidence last March um, on the back of the letter from 23 journalists, Scottish journalists, which you'll be aware of, and they highlighted concerns that they felt the Scottish Government is no longer taking minutes of meetings because they know that those minutes will be subject to FOI. Um, I think we heard one and we heard an example of meetings between the then Finance Secretary uh, John Swinney and Sir Angus Grossart about the Scottish Futures Trusts. Does that concern you? I think any important meeting which is not minuted uh, is, a, is, a, is therefore a, a, there's a, therefore a lack of information. There's a, a lack of information held uh, which may be of interest to people. Uh, the question of which meetings should that cover, uh, which specific ones, what, what, what detail of, should be included in, in relation to those minutes, that's currently dealt with in, for example, the Ministerial Code and, and other places. So I, I think at the moment we've got some codes of practice here and, and a rather disjointed system. Uh, and it's therefore not within my current remit to say you must have that type of minute, you must record this type of meeting. I think it's important to have a detailed and intelligent conversation about where do those parameters truly lie? Because as you would expect, as, as the information commissioner, I'm, I'm keen on pushing out as much information as we can and, and any min minutes not being recorded is, is a lack of information that somebody may, may wish to have. I mean, there is a debate this week about meetings that took place between the current First Minister and the former First Minister um, about a Scottish Government investigation. I mean, given the uh, enormity of the issues and the severity of, of these issues, is that something you would expect to have been minuted? Again, un unfortunately, within the system as it currently is, that's not an area that I've got any superintendence uh, over in terms of, of what's there, uh, and uh, but but in terms of if somebody was looking for it, and and, it, and the minutes are not there, that's a piece of of information that they're not going to get. Not going to get, yeah, because I think you said earlier in your evidence that the more that can be minuted, the better in terms of transparency. Yes, and it's a question then as to what what are then the legal duties to minute, because there's always a balance to be struck, in terms of if absolutely every email and every bit of correspondence and every uh, conversation in the corridor was ever minuted, you, you, you've got the potential of, of bureaucracy grinding everything uh, to a halt. You've also got data protection issues which have to be considered in relation to what is kept and for how long. So there are a lot of moving parts in relation to that. So it's not just, it's not just a straightforward, everything must be recorded, uh, but certainly in terms of freedom of information, 
the more information that is recorded, the more information can be uh, provided on request. Presumably, this is the minuting of meetings generally. This is one of the reasons why you feel we need post-legislative scrutiny. Because of that, absolutely. Okay. And it's not for me at the moment to say where those parameters lie. No, indeed. Um, that could be a job for us. Bill Bowman. Good morning. Um, we've tended to focus on the Scottish Government at the moment, but you, you've said you've done other interventions. So when you've looked at other um, public bodies, are there any common issues which you've identified? Um, the, the issues do vary between, between bodies. Uh, some of the ones that, that, that we look at relate to clearance, for example, uh, as to who has, to, who has the sign off as to whether information is released. And uh, there's a tendency in some authorities, and this is not, not universal, but some authorities it tends to go very high. Uh, and if uh, decision-making is, is always at the top level, that tends to slow things down because uh, it has to go through a number of, of leaps to get up to the, to the ultimate decision-maker. And that's, that's an area where we, we, tr we would much rather it, the power was devolved down to people who could be trusted to, provide, to make those calls. Occasionally, there'll be something that's so sensitive it's got to be dealt with by, by people up at the top end of the organisation. But I think that, that's, that's a general issue, I think, in a, in a number uh, of authorities. Uh, General planning is something that we sometimes see. We, we, we sometimes spot uh, problems with authorities uh, in one quarter's statistics, which are caused by uh, essentially staff planning, uh, unexpected absences, uh, lack of a backup. Uh, so so it's, it's procedures for dealing with that is, is another thing. Uh, training uh, with larger organisations, training in particular can be more uh, of an issue because the more you delegate the the functions of, uh, that that requires the people to whom the functions are delegated to be pro properly trained and in the larger organizations that's not always uh, been the case so they're just a few examples but they, they sound sort of like operational issues rather than um, issues of you know, things not being disclosed or somebody uh, abusing the system shall we say yes i, I in, in terms of that, it very much it is very often procedural. Uh, I mean, it was something that was mentioned in the in the Scottish government intervention that you know very very rarely you know, you're unlikely to find any any malice here. It's, it's very often it's the procedures and it's real people having to deal with the real applications in real time. So things aren't always perfect. Problems happen. Sometimes bad habits creep in, and it's a matter of doing that and also looking at the structure of the system and saying, well, is your process actually helping? you as an organisation and helping your people who have to manage it, or is your process part of the problem? And are you properly training your people to deal with it? Is the freedom of information process in these bodies ones that are just set up and forgotten about, or do you find that they're under you know, review? Uh, I think largely we, we, f we find that they're under review. C certainly for the ones, uh, the larger organisations, we, we see that they, they, they do have them under review in terms of the publication schemes. We sometimes notice uh, delays in updating them. So there's not, again, there's not that as much emphasis on the public, proactive publication side as there is on, on the management of actual requests for information. The authorities that tend to get fewer requests for information, as you might expect, are maybe less likely to keep revisiting their policies and procedures in relation to those because they, have, because they simply have that less demand, so it's not as high up on their agenda. Following on Alec Neil's point, is there a general trend across all bodies for increases in the number of requests? Certainly the numbers of requests across Scotland have gone up. Uh, I'm quite sure there are some authorities where it's not gone up, but, but, but the, the trend is, is certainly to go up. I think it was... Uh, uh, total requests last year were 77,528. That was up 5% on the previous financial year. Uh, from the f and that's the figures given to us by Is the it authorities. Is a trend sort of like that? that just continuing? Yeah, not, not that. It was a, a, a gradual increase. And it's, a, it's an increase that we've noticed over a number of years. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Uh, <clears throat> just... If I may, for the avoidance of doubt, uh, you're clear, Mr. Fisendry, that the, your feeling is the Act is frozen in time uh, and is ripe for post-legislative review on the basis that, I think you said, about an, a new code, technological change, excluded bodies, First Minister's veto. Uh, and if I'm hearing 
correctly from the convener's question, there's merit in reviewing the Act to ensure that meetings uh, can't be deemed informal uh, in order to avoid scrutiny, perhaps, as some people mentioned in the 22nd of March. So can I be clear, you think that this committee should review this Act uh, going forward? Yes, that, that, that's my view. Fantastic, thank you. Um, you mentioned also earlier on that there's a disconnect uh, between the legislation and the practice. You talked about how the legislation was, I think, ranked 42, but the practice actually is better. Now, does that concern you at all? Because, of course, the practice can change. The legislation presumably can't. So, again, is this about we need to be looking at where the legislation is falling short to make sure that that mirrors the practice and keeps it at the high level? I think it's certainly a case of making sure that the legislation uh, supports the practice. So as, as a regulator, uh, what I want to do is to be able to give the best and most efficient and effective regulation that I can. And that sometimes will mean changing the way that, that we do things and having the correct tools in my toolkit to do it. And that's why one of the things I mentioned in, in, in my uh, initial uh, uh, discussion was um, an increasing emphasis on intervention because that's a, a, a way of improving the practice across the board and as part of that looking at what my current enforcement powers are. So although I, I can uh, put a, make an enforcement, issue an enforcement notice for breaches of the Act, I can't issue an enforcement notice for breaches of the Code of Practice. All I can do is issue a practice recommendation which is just that, a recommendation. Uh, and that might work with public authorities as they currently are, because public authorities, you know, uh, credit, you know, they, they're there, they, they, they serve the public, they want to do a good job, and they don't want to be criticised for not doing a good job. But as we look at uh, the scope of freedom of information in the future, we've got a forthcoming consultation on expanding it to uh, privately owned bodies who are delivering public services, Will a practice recommendation have the same weight, or the threat of a practice recommendation have the same weight to bodies like that, which have shareholders and a bottom line to meet, uh, when compared with public bodies? Uh, and I'm just concerned that in terms of, of this push to be more proactive in our regulation, additional powers would be useful, and in particular, uh, the ability to enforce more strongly codes of practice, should it come to it. Uh, also things like... Uh, Part of our intervention involved uh, questioning witnesses. I have no powers under the current Act to compel witnesses to come and give evidence to me. We were fortunate that with the Scottish Government, they were very, you know, uh, very accommodating and uh, agreed to come and give evidence to me. But that, again, is, is something in the Act which can help our practice and that uh, it's worked OK to date, but if an authority decided it wasn't going to be accommodating, uh, it would make my life much more difficult and it would mean the product I can provide at the end of the day is not as good. And again, in relation to proactive publication, as I mentioned before, uh, if, if the tools aren't flexible enough, uh, relying on, on an old-fashioned you know, concept of, of, of a publication scheme, it, it dis detracts from, from what the focus of the organisation should be on, which is what can we publish, what can we push out there, and again, linked to that, if we could have a code of practice focusing on that area, an enforceable code, then again, you're allowing the regulator to have a much, a much uh, greater control uh, and influence to keep practice standards high. Uh, so yes, I, I, I agree with your point that there's, self, the, the, there's a, a very close connection between practice and the legislation, and the legislation should always support the improvement of better practice. Uh, final thing from me, since the meeting on the 22nd of March, uh, the GDPR, the, the data protection uh, legislation has come into force. Uh, have you seen that have any noticeable impact uh, on FOI requests, on the disclosures being given, uh, and indeed the operation of the Act? Uh, in relation to that, we haven't yet seen any um, noticeable impact uh, on that. We had partially expected to see uh, an increased caution, if I can put it that way, on, on the part of authorities.
but we're yet to see any material uh, evidence of that. We're still in very early days in terms of uh, the GDPR coming into force and then the Freedom of Information applications being made after that date reviews and to appeals, but, but we've not yet seen anything. I don't know if Margaret yeah, can... I mean, we're actually doing we're on, unfortunately on transitional provisions at the moment, so we're still making decisions under the old legislation because the initial decision by the, the public authority um, was made under the old legislation, but we are starting to see them coming, new applications coming through now, and we're actually pleasantly surprised um, at the um, practical and good practice approach being taken by authorities. Thank you. And ask Sarwar. Firstly, good morning, Mr. Virginian, and thank you for your frank answers uh, this morning and for clearly stating your view as the Information Commissioner that we should have post legislative scrutiny of uh, this Act. I think that is very helpful and very welcome. Uh, just a couple of follow-up questions, uh, firstly, from uh, to Alec Neil's questions. I should say I've pre-ordered Alec's book uh, already. Um, there's an alternative view, though, isn't there, in terms of that increase in numbers? Has there been any analysis done on the number of freedom of information requests that have come from parliamentarians? and parliamentary researchers to the Scottish Government, how that has increased, and that could be a direct correlation from the quality of answers that you're getting from parliamentary questions, and that dropping in quality, therefore resulting in an increase in the number of freedom of information requests. Uh, I, I certainly haven't conducted a, an, an, an analysis of, of the Scottish Government's uh, requests and, and where those requesters uh, are, are coming from. Uh, I can certainly say that we have seen a number of requests from political researchers, uh, from uh, elected uh, officials in, in relation to uh, public authorities. So, so, we, so we, do, we do see it, we see it as, as being a, a noticeable number. Uh, there's always going to be a link between what information is pushed out proactively and what information people have to seek. And they will generally use some people will use a scattergun approach and seek information from a, a number of different sources in a number of different ways. Others will seek what's the best way and easiest way of getting the information. Um, so, so, yeah, if, if, there, if people feel that they're not getting answers in some of the more traditional ways, I've got no doubt that they will then move on and, and use freedom of information as another alternative way of getting that information. More often than not, if I was to submit a parliamentary question, I would submit an identical FOI to the relevant government department because I know I'll hopefully get the right answer at least in one of the two of them. Do you agree that the FOI scheme should not be seen as an alternative to parliamentary scrutiny and answer of parliamentary questions and both processes should be robust? I, 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 absolutely. I mean, the, the issue of parliamentary questions is again well and squarely outside my, my bailiwick, so I can only speak to, to freedom of information. But in terms of freedom of information, it's very important that that system is robust. And it's a rights-based system. So it is a right for anybody to access the information held by Scottish public authorities. And that's actually why the request for information piece of, of the legislation uh, is, is, a, is still alive and kicking and, and fit for purpose because it's based on a simple right. Uh, and it's important to safeguard that. Just a final question on that part is, do you also accept if the number of FOI requests from parliamentarians and parliamentary researchers fell, that would be a significant saving uh, on the public purse? Uh, so that's another reason why parliamentary questions perhaps should be answered appropriately in the first place. I think any, any, re any reduction, uh, any, any proactive publication or proactive push out of information may have an impact on, on the number of freedom of information requests with a resultant saving. Uh, it will vary from, from public authority to public authority. And just on the, on the minutes point, do, do, you, do you think that any meeting that takes place, whether it's an individual or an organisation, lobbying the Scottish Government or a Scottish Government Minister on any matter relating to the Scottish Government, should be minuted. So, sorry. I, I, so in, any, any meeting that takes place that is the lobbying of government, whether that's by an individual or an organisation, that that meeting should be minuted? That is an, an, an interesting question about, uh, obviously, looking at the, the Lobbying Act as, as it's currently drafted. That deals with one half of, of it. That deals with the individuals who, who are lobbying. The question then is, well, is an answer to, you know, is a legislative uh, way of dealing with this to, to have the the mirror image of that, whereby the uh, uh, official who, ha who has the, the meeting 
also has to register it. So yeah, I, it's certainly one potential way forward, but, but that's a matter to... So what I'm meaning is, so for the lobbying act, it would be an individual. So if an individual is lobbying a government minister, so just say an individual is lobbying the first minister in relating to a Scottish government matter, should that meeting be minuted? Uh, well, I mean, that's, you know, assuming that that is uh, in, in accordance with the current rules they should do what's in accordance with the current rules. In terms of future rules, I think that's that's part of the discussion that the, the committee and uh, if they choose to put forward, look at that, should have. My position, as I've made clear already, is that we should be minuting you know, anything of importance, important decisions, issues which relate to those important decisions. And the more that's minuted, the more information that can go out to people. I don't think I'm in a position at the moment in terms of the current construct to go outside my current bailiwick. Uh, and one last question. Do you think it's only the decisions that should be minuted or the content of the, de not the detailed content, but the issues that are discussed that should also be minuted? I think if you're simply recording that, that, that a meeting has occurred, that is not providing an awful lot of information and it would always be of benefit to those who, who are seeking, and in the spirit of openness and transparency, it's going to be of benefit to have uh, uh, some indication as to what was discussed at that meeting. Thank you. Mr Fitzhenry, let me um, ask you, go back to the issue of the scope of the Act, because that was uh, a broad theme of the discussion last March when we took evidence on this before. Now, the Scottish Government has extended the scope of FOI and recently they've extended that to include some arm's length organisations that provide, for instance, leisure and culture services to uh, local councils and also private prison contracts and other things like that. But we did hear evidence last year that people felt it hadn't gone quite far enough and that there are other bodies that need to fall within the gambit of the Act. So. I'd like to hear your views on that today, if you feel there are other organisations that should be included. But I want to ask you specifically if you think um, organisations that are providing uh, services to the Scottish Futures Trust should come under the gambit of the Act as well. Yes, I think the, the issue of scope is, is an important one because we've seen... Uh, over the years, a change in the way that public services are provided uh, across the board with, with a move to more and more public, public services which were uh, historically provided by public bodies now being outsourced to other bodies. So we're seeing a deficit in, in uh, bodies being subject to the Act. And uh, as in line with my predecessors, you'll not be surprised that I, I support the, the uh, expansion of, of the Act to those bodies uh, who are providing those public functions. Uh, now, the Scottish Government has uh, announced its intent to have a consultation on a number of these bodies, uh, and that's certainly something that we'll be uh, actively uh, involving ourselves with uh, to press for greater uh, extension of uh, the uh, Act. I think one of those areas that certainly should be looked at are the functions of a number of uh, at-length organisations who are providing public services who are uh, involved in the expenditure of large sums of public money. Uh, I think the detail uh, has to be worked out in relation to those uh, bodies uh, to see uh, which ones should be included and for in particularly in relation to which functions. And that's, that's where the, the, the detail comes in uh, because if you've got private companies which are providing services, are, are providing uh, a public function, but they're also providing a number of private functions as part of the, the rest of the duty. It's important that we focus on those areas of public functions that, uh, that they're involved in. And in relation to that, I think that they're potentially for, for scrutiny, there may be merit in looking at sections five and seven of uh, FOISA, because um, it was something that was mentioned to me uh, in the Holyrood Conference in December uh, by a participant that there, uh, on one reading of, of the current legislation, somebody could be uh, designated in respect of, of, or a body could be designated in respect of a specific function under the Freedom of Information Scotland Act. And under one reading, that could make them subject to the 
environmental information regulations for all of their functions. Now, I'm not, I haven't yet come to a, a, a definitive view as to whether that interpretation is correct or not, but it's certainly on the face of it that's, that would be an arguable position to take. And I think if we're looking at extending the Act out to other bodies, we want to remove blocks to that happening. We want to make it as easy a process as possible and to be able to give them the assurance that if we're pushing it out to them, it's going to be in respect to the public functions and no further. S sorry to interrupt. Again, that's something that could be done under post-legislative scrutiny. Do you agree? Yes. OK. L let me drill down a wee bit on this Scottish Futures Trust issue because you mentioned the Scottish Government consultation. Um, it's my understanding from reports in the press that that consultation is going ahead and they are looking at um, other bodies, but I believe that the Scottish Government were unable to confirm that the companies providing services for Scottish Futures Trust would be included even in the gambit of that consultation. Do you believe it should be, they should be con under the government consultation? I, I think certainly as part of the consultation, we should be having that discussion, yes. and, and, see, and, and, then, and then a view can be taken. But we should be, we should be you know, casting quite a wide net in relation to that cons consultation, in my view. Obviously, that's, it's a matter for the government to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, to we, cut off the discussion at that level would, would, in my view, be wrong. It should be a wide discussion, uh, and then a view can be taken at the end of, of that once everybody's been able to put in the, the, the detail. I mean, Sorry, there is, in fact, a duty on the Scottish Ministers um, to consult everyone they're considering, um, covering anyone appearing to them to represent such persons and also other persons that they consider appropriate, and that's already in the, the legislation. I mean, it's of huge interest to this committee because it's our job here to follow the public pound, and currently there's, I think, £2.7 billion of those pounds in the budget on these projects under the remit of the Scottish Futures Trust and it could cost the taxpayer in the region of £9 billion in the future once the interest comes in. So, I mean, would you, given the enormity of that expenditure, Mr Fitzhenry, would you like to see them, you know, at the end of our post-legislative scrutiny if we decide to pursue that, would you like to see these companies covered by FOI? I would certainly, yes, I would certainly like to see a, a lot more focus at on such large amounts of public money and in relation to the public functions that they are fulfilling, yes, those are areas that, that I would like to see uh, okay. uh, the scope of the Act extended. Uh, with regard to the detail as to how that would work, obviously, as you would expect, that's something we'll have to work up in our consultation response. But so sort of top level, yes, we would like an extension out there. OK. I don't want to let you leave this morning uh, if there's any further um, parts of the Act that you want to tell us you feel need reviewed. So, firstly, on the scope, are there other areas that you think should fall within the remit of FOI? And are there any other parts of the Act that you would like to see reviewed? Um, in, in relation to the, the scope, as I say, I think, I think this is the, the consultation is, is, is the, the big area that internationally as well as nationally there's a lot of interest and, and I think it's important to have the focus on that. We're obviously still awaiting the uh, order to extend, Section 5 order to extend uh, FOISA to uh, the registered social landlords uh, and we're, we're looking forward to that occurring uh, imminently so that we can proceed with, with our work on, on that. Um, in relation to, to the other points which I, I briefly mentioned earlier on, which were sections 48 and section 52 of uh, the Act. 48 is, is the exclusion uh, of uh, an application to me, so an exclusion of an appeal to me in relation to decisions taken by Procurators Fiscal uh, and the Lord Advocate. Uh, now, I know from uh, the notes taken at the time and the memoranda at the time that the reason that's based on section 48 of the Scotland Act um, which talks about uh, the decisions of the Lord Advocate in relation to uh, his role as the head of the uh, system of prosecutions in Scotland and uh, investigation of deaths should be made independently of any other person. So it was viewed that uh, a decision whether or not to release information under FOISA was also prohibit prohibited by that. I'm not so sure that Section 48 of the Scotland Act is as prescriptive as that, because I, I don't believe when making a decision on freedom of information, the Lord Advocate is, is acting really in his capacity as head of those systems. He's acting very much as any other public, Scottish public authority is acting 
under the Freedom of Information system. So uh, we've got a system in Scotland whereby uh, these prosecutorial, uh, this information cannot be appealed to an independent body, um, which is not the case in England and Wales, where the decisions of the uh, Crown Prosecution Service can be examined by the ICO. So we've got a deficit uh, in relation to the rest of the UK on that point, and I think that's something that's worthy of, of examination. Uh, and Section 52, that's the First Minister's uh, veto, that's in relation to uh, the Scottish administration, in relation to cases involving certain exemptions. The First Minister can, in effect, uh, state that uh, a decision notice or an enforcement notice issued by me is to have no effect. Uh, it's never been used in Scotland. Uh, the equivalent provisions in England and Wales have been used on a number of occasions by ministers, albeit the courts have clamped down on, on, on the use of it and reduced the scope of the use of it. But to me, it seems to be an, anom an anomaly. Uh, we have a system whereby it goes to an independent uh, regulator and then there's an appeal from that on a point of law if I've got it wrong. Uh, and I think the law should be ap applicable equally to all parts of the Scottish administration as, as to any other Scottish public body. Uh, and I don't think there's any need for this to get out of jail free card. I'm pleased to see that the, to date there's been no, viewed to be no need uh, on the part of the, the Scottish the First Minister to, to apply, or any of the First Ministers to apply it either. But I think those are two areas where there's that anomaly in scope, uh, and I'd like to see, the, see those revisited if, if the committee would consider doing so. Thank you very much. Do members have any further questions for the Information Commissioner team? Okay. Can I thank you very much indeed for your evidence this morning? I now close the public session of this meeting. Thank you.